Jump cut. The city street where the young man got a flat. Vehicular traffic streams along as the young man now jogs, desperately trying to get to his destination on time. Interior. The language school. A classroom. Three or four minutes later. Several students, including J.O., sit down in a classroom and patiently wait for their teacher to arrive. There is a pregnant silence. A few students whisper to each other. Jump cut. Another street. The young man keeps jogging fast. By now, his white shirt is untucked from his pants and soaked in sweat. His tie is disheveled. His jacket is damp, too. Young man, with tears of anger and exertion in his eyes. Shit, shit, shit! <laughs> Jump cut. Interior, the language school, the same classroom. Students are getting more restless now. They begin chatting with each other more loudly. A few look at the wall clock. Jump cut. Interior. The lobby of the language school. The young man arrives in the lobby. He looks as exhausted as a marathon runner, which, in a manner of speaking, he is. He looks forlornly at the elevator light as it slowly and frustratingly makes its way down to the lobby. Jump cut. Interior. The classroom. Girl student with Russian accent. What is teacher name? Another girl student, looking at she. Paul. Russian girl. You know him? Another girl. No, he knew. Russian student. Maybe mistake. She looks at the sheet of paper more carefully. Another girl. No mistake. Russian girl, determined. I go ask Lucille. She leaves the classroom as she does more hubbub. Jump cut. The lobby. The young man in front of an elevator door. SFX. The elevator is cheerful, indifferent. Ding! Jump cut. Interior. The language school. A hallway. The Russian girl and Lucille, the school's manager, walk quickly towards the classroom where the other students wait. Russian girl. Lucille. Where's teacher? Lucille, with repressed anger. I don't know. Jump cut. Interior. The lobby of the language school itself, a moment later. An elevator door opens and the young man bursts out. At the same time, he is looking through a notebook he's grabbed from his backpack as he looks for some critical information. Young man to himself. Room 214. Room 214. He walks toward where the classrooms start and scans various room number plates. Interior. The teacherless classroom at the same moment. The Russian girl and Lucille enter. Lucille. There seems to be a problem. At this very moment, the young man bursts in, a smile on his face. The students, looking at this intruder and then at the manager, regard both with blank faces. Young man. To the students with a smile. Hi there! <laughs> then noticing Lucille. Oh, uh, hi Lucille. Lucille, coldly. Paul, what happened? Wasn't Peter clearer about the start time when he hired you? Paul, busted. Yeah. <laughs> Lucille, then what happened? Let's talk out here. She exits to the hallway. Paul follows. Jump cut. The hallway. Paul, quickly. I'm so sorry. My bike tire burst. Lucille, losing her grip, now noticeably upset. Why didn't you phone? I'm so sorry. The payphone, it didn't work. There was just one. I was on DuPont Street. It's just car garages and stuff. I didn't have a cell or enough for a taxi. I ran. Okay, well, fine. Whatever. You'd better get started. They've been waiting 20 minutes. I'm really, really sorry, Lucille, harshly. Don't apologize. Teach. Interior. The classroom. One second later. Paul enters the classroom. There's a moment of silence. The eyes of every single student settle on him, both expectant and assessing. In his sweat-soaked shirt, his barely knotted tie and matted hair, he looks as much like a competent teacher as a mobster looks like a caring social worker. And something in Paul's facial expression seems to acknowledge this. So many things have gone wrong already that it is almost as if the situation cannot be salvaged. On the spur of the moment, people have walked away from new jobs because of less. But teaching is a social profession. 
It's not as if Paul works inside a cubicle and has just had words with a hostile boss, and that is what the entire universe of his job adds up to. Other people are counting on him. He looks at the students, and, just as he himself seems ready to concede defeat, somewhere inside him, somewhere visceral and preconscious, he reaches a resolution. His body language changes and becomes stronger and more confident. Paul. Hi, everyone. Well, um, sorry, I was a little late this morning. What happened was I was riding my bike. He pauses, looking at the students, trying to gauge how much of this story they actually comprehend. Paul, slowing down his speaking. From my home to here is very far. I took my bike here. With body language, he mimics someone riding a bicycle. I was coming here, and suddenly, bang, flat tire. There was glass on the road. A bad person put it there. Maybe a drunk person. A whiskey person. He mimics a drunk weaving around and then smashing a bottle on the ground. A few students laugh. Paul, warming up. So I went over that glass, and my bicycle wheel, pow, and then pshhh. And I tried to phone, but the phone didn't work. So I ran here. I ran almost two kilometers. More nervous laughter. It was hard, but I went as fast as I could, and that's how I got here. The students are now looking at him with interest. Paul. And, uh, Lucille, she was angry. A few students laugh out loud, Paul mimicking her. Why are you late? Get in there and teach! Several students guffaw. Paul, so I was late. I'm sorry, but tomorrow I'll be on time, I promise. And you be on time too, okay? Promise? Two students clap their approval, then in a moment the rest join in. Paul grins. He's going to be okay. Interior, the teacher's room.